Hi, I'm Vinod Thrani, one of the cardiac surgeons at the Piedmont Heart Institute, and it's my absolute pleasure to now have a series of topics that we're going to discuss with our colleagues, not only at Piedmont Heart Institute, but also regionally and nationally, about topics that are very important and timely in the management of cardiovascular disease. We thought we'd, we'd start our series with really one of the best surgeons that I've ever met in my life. We've known each other for almost 30 years now. 30 years. Uh, and is Morris Brown, one of my partners and good friends, who we're, today we're gonna talk about an absolutely exciting topic. It's something that is really uh, has changed and has been revolutionized over both of our lifetimes. Um, and it's the aorta program that we have here at Piedmont Heart Institute. So uh, Morris just uh, wanted to welcome you to this session and we're gonna really uh, learn a lot from you, I hope on the management of aortic, valve, uh, aortic disease. Well, it, it should be fun to talk about it, Vino. So um, just a, a minute to mention our aortic program. Um, it takes a, a team to do this kind of surgery. It's a big surgery and it involves cardiac surgery. It involves vascular surgery. It involves cardiology, both on the imaging side and the uh, structural uh, interventionalist. And we've uh, melded all that into one team to help attack these sometimes very Real, difficult true problems. Village, true village. So this in, in incorporates the Piedmont Heart Institute, both Piedmont Atlanta and Piedmont Athens, where we do all the cardiac surgery within the, within the uh, system. Um, as far as disclosures go, um, currently I, have, I don't have any, and uh, you have a few there, uh, as we mentioned, but I don't think any of that impacts any of the, yeah, absolutely. the valve center. Um, as far as the history of aortic surgery goes, it goes way back to 1948, and thank goodness we made a, a, a lot of improvements since then. Dr. Nissen tried to wrap the aorta of Albert Einstein with cellophane, and it lasted for about four years. But the, the technologies that we have today are much more durable and much more long-lasting and uh, can attack a wide variety of problems. Morris, how, you think he even did an IRB for that? Uh, <laughs> did, did probably he just brought, any approval? brought the cellophane from home, I, I suspect. Probably did. Um, one of the biggest advantages that I think has helped me as a surgeon is the imaging. Because if you go in there knowing exactly what the anatomy is going to look like, then that really helps you to A, stay out of trouble, and B, just know what you have to do to fix whatever problem it is. And we get these beautiful 3D renditionings uh, from our imaging guys, and you just know exactly what you're going to expect bef before you get in there. And we have these image scanners all throughout our network. So it's not just at the Atlanta Hospital, but we also, also have it at other places. But this has been a place where you take a lot of these images and you have your own program with the vascular surgeons where you can manipulate these images and look around. How Correct. important has that been for you? Correct. That's, that's huge. That's really everything. Um, and it's the manipulation that helps you to follow the patients, to get accurate sizing, and then it helps you if you're going to plan a complex repair as well. That's great. Um, some of the complex anatomy, like th this was a case that we did that came, uh, that had a stent graft that was placed at another hospital um, and got it, it got infected, so he was transferred here for his care because fixing these infected stent grafts is, is very difficult and very complicated. And we, we did. Well, you got to you got to tell me what's going on here. This is like an alien. Well, we this this is the native aorta, ascending aorta, and then that's a staple line across it. The stent graft used to be over here. Um, now this is an extra anatomic bypass that goes through the pericardium um, that was put in through a sternotomy that goes to the descending aorta, and then another staple line down here, and then up in the infected bed where the stent graft came from, we got one of the plastic surgeons to put a latissimus flap to help cover that. And, Isn't that amazing? And so we just completely rerouted the blood flow. I wasn't happy at the time of surgery with the offtake of the left carotid because it was pinched a little bit. And so I just added this graft onto the top to, to have uh, a debranching um, of that left common carotid. That wasn't part of the original procedure, but um, it's what you needed. It's what you needed to do. It's what we and needed. we'll get more into the debranching soon. Uh, that's a term that you just threw that a lot of cardiologists may not understand. So we'll show a lot more pictures about the debranching soon. Right. So yep. we'll, we'll we'll get into that. Yep. Um, as far as the techniques for complex uh, aortic reconstruction, um, one of the biggest adjuncts that we have is deep hypothermia and circulatory rest. And this was first done in 1975 by Dr. Greep for repair of aortic surgery it had been used before that for congenital surgery. Um, but this has been very helpful to us because you can do the anastomosis open 
you can see every stitch and um, hemostasis is really good that way and the success of this is, is all about the hemostasis. Um, replacement of the aorta with the you know uh, modern day materials with Dacron grafts, covered spring-loaded stent grafts um, have really expanded what we're able to do because we can combine endovascular techniques with uh, the open surgical techniques. And you're going to show some really beautiful examples of that collaboration with vascular surgery for these. Right, because that, that is so important. Um, to go back to the debranching that we talked about a minute right. ago, um, the, the head vessels, you know, the innominate on the right-hand side, then the left carotid and the left subclavian, those are the branches off the arch. And the arch has really been one of the most difficult places right. to repair because the, the blood flow of the brain depends on the arch. And so you have to interrupt that for a period of time to repair that and how to come out with a patient who has his cognitive uh, function intact at the end of that is, is has difficult. Has been limited, yeah, right. And right. been limited. Um, and so th sometimes we debranch these, and if we debranch them, a lot of times we don't need the heart lung machine. We don't need circulatory arrest. If we do them one at a time and do them sequentially, that maintains blood flow through the other, other uh, sources, and the patients uh, do just fine with that. That's great. Um, and then hybrid combinations. One of, the, one of the most difficult things, you have all these different pieces to the puzzle to play with, and you have to tailor your therapy to each patient. And you need to decide which pieces of the puzzle to use for which patients and which one is going to get you this successful outcome at the end. That's great. Um, other things, uh, antegrade cerebral perfusion to uh, give blood flow to the brain through the veins while you have the heart-lung machine turned off. Um, that extends the period that you can safely keep the heart-lung machine turned off. Same with antegrade cerebral perfusion. Antegrade perfusion is, is a little newer. Um, it's a little more difficult to do and you have to be a little more cognizant of air and just watching some of the technical details. Retrograde is tried and true and it, it uh, actually, because the blood flow is backwards, any little particles that get up in there get washed out. Um, you know, recent randomized controlled studies show that it didn't really matter whether you did antegrade or retrograde, just so you did something that the, the margin of safety was increased by doing one of these adjuncts. The key thing is that what we're really striving for is protection of the brain. Right. It's the heart that does pretty well in these patients. It's the brain that we're really worried about. And that's why there's been so much attention, like you just illustrated, on how to protect that brain during that ischemia time. Correct. That, right. Because that, that's the most pressing. We can keep the heart, you know, safe and with a good margin of safety for very right. long periods of time with current cardioplegic techniques. But cerebral technique, there really is no cerebral plegia. You just have to maintain blood flow. That's right. Um, Spinal drainage, you know, if you're doing descending thoracic surgery, um, the blood flow to the anterior horns that control the motor function of the legs is dependent on the artery of Adamkowitz that comes off around the diaphragm. And sometimes we have to resect that, sometimes we have to cover it with a stent graft. And so in order to maintain the perfusion pressure to the spinal cord, we either have to raise the arterial pressure with permissive uh, hypertension, or we have to lower the resistance to the flow by dropping the CSF pressure. And so there are limits to how much you can drop the CSF pressure because of the, the pressures within, within the intracranial cavity. Um, so you have, it's a balance between the two. Yep. Very important. So let's just go over a few of the operations that, that we do. This is probably one of the most common that we do. This is called a Bentol because it was described first by Dr. Bentol and Dr. DeBono in 1968. Um, and it's where the valve is resected, the portion of the aorta that contains the valve, that's called the root, um, is resected. The coronary arteries which come into that area are, are um, moved off of that area with a small piece of surrounding aortic tissue so that you can put it back together. And then all of the ascending aorta. You can see that um, we, with circulatory rest, we can go all the way up right to the edge of the innominate. This is not really a hemi-arch. Uh, this is just to the proximal arch. Um, and then replace that with synthetic graft. This shows a, a biological porcine route uh, to replace the valve, and then the coronary is plugged into the side of that. But this could really be anything. It could be a mechanical valve with um, an attached graft, or it could be a bio route uh, that either comes pre-made or that we can make on the back table. Yeah, and you and I really enjoy doing these cases. You know, it's, it's funny. We, we do this as a morning case and do other cases afterwards. I remember at the other institutions I was at, this would be an entire case for the whole day. This, and yeah. so <laughs> you and I can uh, be done with these cases very expeditiously. 
and we're uh, we're out by early um, or late morning and and are yeah. ready for our next Lunch, cases at, at lunchtime. That's yeah, right. This, this exactly. used to be when when I was training. This was an all day case. Yeah, um, and, and it now, still is at other institutions. And right? yeah, now we we get them finished by lunchtime, yep. and then I go see the patient after a second case, and they're awake and yeah. extubated by the afternoon. And what's this uh, for those of you who send us these patients? This is an important thing. You'll see us. Uh, all the root is gone. The coronary has been rerouted and also the valve is a new valve. But Morris, tell me this, what, what's important for a cardiologist when they send us these patients? Should they, is there some information that's helpful to you? Uh, right, because we, we do want a heart catheterization on all of these patients. If there's some anatomic reason we can't do that, we can do it with CT scan. But we need to know, um, is there any you know, uh, stenosis of the coronary arteries? Because that can be easily taken care of at the time of surgery. Um, but also, we need to know the anatomy of the root. Do, they, do the coronary arteries come off in the correct place? Is there some congenital anomaly of the coronaries that we need to be aware of? Anomalous right, especially, that would be very important. Especially, because right. that, you know, you can, it, by, when you're disconnecting it and, and dissecting all this, if you know where all that is, you can avoid injuring any of the branches. And every branch is important. Absolutely. Right. So, um, and then also the the type of uh, aortic valve, whether it's tricuspid or bicuspid, right. is important because that also changes the, where the coronary arteries come off. Yeah. And putting it back together, you need to put it back together as it came off so that you avoid kinking and any other kind of problems. And I think that down the road we'll do another uh, talk on uh, bicuspid valve therapy and well, how do you deal with bicuspid, the different Seavers classifications and the aortic uh, aneurysms associated with that. Maybe we have enough to talk about aorta here. We'll come back and talk about that one. Okay. Yeah, we may, we may spend all of our time on, That's the, right. on, on dissections and, and other uh, arch aneurysms. So one of the biggest steps forward in arch uh, replacement, it really was the holy grail. It was the place that nobody could really fix. Um, Dr. Borst from Germany came up with this idea that he would, um, he called it an elephant trunk because he would place uh, an inverted graft into the descending thoracic aorta and leave that hanging in there like the trunk of an elephant. Um, and so that graft is sort of inverted on itself and then this string that you see is actually attached to the very distal end down here so to uh, facilitate retrieval of this end when you pull it back out so that you can anastomose uh, the head vessels to it. This, this is the island of the head vessels and this is where all the blood flow should be and you can either maintain anti-grade cerebral perfusion with a, with a uh, subclavian cannulation technique um, or you can do retrograde cerebral perfusion or you can put cannulas directly up the, the carotids as, as is shown here. And for this patient, Morris, what's happened is that the aorta, the aortic valve is intact, the coronary arteries are intact, the ace in the aorta is gone, the arch is gone, so this is a patient with aneurysm of the ace in the aorta and the arch. And the arch. Right? right? And maybe the distal thoracic and, aorta, is that right? And it, but it, not much. It can't. That, this picture doesn't really show that that's aneurysmal, right. but for a lot, of, a lot of times doing these elephant trunks, it is, okay. and that facilitates fixing the next stage down the road. I call it big boy surgery. This is not, this is not the straightforward. This is, this, is, <laughs> this is usually not just a morning case. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you, you place that inverted graft into the descending thoracic aorta, and then with a running suture, sew that to the distal aorta, and then pull the graft back into the field so that once you pull it completely back, you can cut a hole in it and sew the uh, head vessels in as an island, or you can put, um, it can be a specialized graft that has side branches on it, and you can sew these individually with side branches, depending on what the anatomy calls for. Yeah, it's beautiful. And then what, why, why leave that distal part in the aorta, uh, in, well, that, in, if, that, in that thoracic aorta? In, in, in this picture, um, this sits inside of a distal aneurysm, and uh, what we used to have to do was go in through a thoracotomy, which is difficult for the patients, and cut the aorta and reach in and grab this graft and then put a clamp on it. And there, that was, you know, 10 seconds of terror. Um, and now that's gone away because we just mark the distal ends with some radiopaque markers. And uh, you, with our vascular colleagues, we're able to, doing endografts from the groin, uh, place an endograft up in here. And the markers help us make sure that we're not inverting this distal graft as we put the endograft in there. And then just 
load the endograph, and the patients can go home in about a, in about a day or two. That's great. Which is way different than what it a was lot, A lot of credit to our vascular surgeons. I know Ben is one of the directors of the aortic program with us. Uh, we just are blessed to have really phenomenal, collaborative vascular surgeons. Correct, because right. this, this really has been game-changing because a, a lot of the patients died waiting for the second stage because the first stage is, is so difficult to get over. And if you were going to do a thoracotomy, you had to wait at least six weeks. Yeah. And there was a, a significant number a of double hit, a double hit that, yep. that died during that waiting period. And this, uh, many times, uh, you know, uh, either Dr. Anzaitig or Ben Ari or Ross will do this at the, the same admission. Yeah, that's great. That's excellent. Big advancement. Um, and this, this just shows a picture of one that we did um, with an island of the uh, head vessels. And stage two was done with a stent graft. Um, and there's two segments of stent graft in this with the overlap about there. Um, and you can see that there's, there's no flow in, into any false lumen and the aneurysm is completely gone. Yeah, that's great. That's great, Morris. So let's, let's just talk about stent grafts for a little bit. Um, as far as where you land the stent grafts, um, it's divided into zones. So it's the Isomuro classification. And zone three is just distal to the subclavian artery. Zone two is probably the most common place because the, frequently this portion is aneurysmal at the end of zone three. And you need a, an area that you can get a seal and you have to cover the subclavian and that requires that the carotid be connected to the subclavian. And again, our vascular colleagues help us, help us with that. Um, zone one is something that should always be avoided. And zone zero is, is no one man. of those things. It's no yeah. man's land. It's something that we have just said, you know, never land a graft in zone zero, but you'll see with some of the debranching techniques, that's actually what we're doing is extending the, the safe landing zone of, all the way over to zone zero. Wow, look, I feel like we just jumped from algebra to calculus, right? I mean, I think we're just, now we're gonna talk about some stuff that's really innovative, but also very complex. But this is where it gets complicated. This is where it gets complicated. Yeah. And so this is, you know, a fairly simple one. Uh, the stent graft covers the subclavian, and as I said, this required a carotid subclavian to keep the left arm perfused. Um, but again, and you do that at the same time, Morris, right? Same time. Yep. Yep. Same time. Need to. Yep. And it, if if it calls for bilateral, we generally stage that and do one side and then do the other at the at the time of the stent graft placement. Um, because the subclavian um, is covered by the stent graft, um, if you don't close the end of the subclavian. Um, it can uh, cause a leak and Got it. Retrograde. Press, yep. pressurize that aneurysm. And so you need to plug that subclavian because you want to maintain flow to the vertebral on that side. So you have to plug it all the way where it comes off of the arch. And these amplats or vascular plugs are very helpful for that. They're put in uh, under fluoroscopic guidance, uh, again, with the vascular colleagues. And it's been very effective at plugging uh, that artery and, and uh, preventing the type 2 endoly. Great. Um, and so why is it important with aortic dissection to do these stent grafts at the same time? It's a little more trouble, it's a little more time at the time of surgery. So why is it important to do that? And the INSTEAD trial illustrates that very nicely. This was a study of type B dissection where they treated with stent grafts or with medical therapy. And the, the, the group that was treated with the stent grafts, 92% of them had false lumen thrombosis at the 24 month follow-up period versus only 19% of the, those treated medically for, for uh, uncomplicated type B dissection. And the survival curves started to separate at 24 months. And so there is a survival advantage to have that false lumen thrombose, and then they get to be more like a normal aorta. And even though these dissection patients are complicated, um, they do have a lot of times residual dissections. And so it's something that we need to see. Yeah, life, I was, that, just, that just makes me think of that, you know, and, and all of us in the partnership here, the seven surgeons and the two in Athens, soon to be three in Athens, we all do aortic dissections. But I think it's important to follow these patients, not only at 30 days, but yearly. And our aortic program really wants to see these patients so that we longitudinally follow them so they can get treated with stent grafts it's down the road as needed. Correct. It, it's one of the few things that cardiac surgeons follow their entire lives. That's right. Yeah. Very important. Um, other technologies that help us see what we're doing when we're doing these stent grafts, it's very important to be in the true lumen where the blood flow should be. <clears throat> and you can see that the uh, catheter is in the true lumen here. And in real time, uh, you can see during systole that the true lumen expands and the false lumen is compressed. And so you can tell which one is which, even if the shapes aren't exactly like they should be. 
Um, there's some new technologies for uh, type B dissections, and I think this just uh, emphasizes the fact that we're trying to get that false lumen to thrombose. So Cook makes uh, a, this open weave technology. It can be placed right across the visceral vessels in the abdomen, and it helps oppose that uh, muscle septum or vascular septum uh, to the wall of the, of the false lumen, so the false lumen becomes thrombosed, yet the flow to the visceral vessels is maintained. This kind of open weave technology has been proposed for the arch. It's currently not approved for that, but it's something that we'll probably see in the future. Yeah, I think so. I think this is technology is going to start moving into that zone zero a lot more over the next five years. Correct. I, right. I agree. So this is where it really begins to get complex. Um, we already went over fro uh, elephant trunk. Frozen elephant trunk is where you place a stent graft and a grade at the time of circulatory rest. Um, for a standard ascending and arch replacement. Um, open hybrid with debranching, um, these come in several types. This is a Bavaria classification. Um, if you maintain the native aorta, it's a type one, and you run these branches up, they go to the anominate and the left carotid, and plus minus the left subclavian, you can either attach the carotid to the subclavian, or you can put a separate branch from the main, the main aortic trunk. Um, if you replace the ascending aorta, and the, the criteria because of dissections is actually a little lower, so we would replace an ascending aorta that's any, anywhere around 4 centimeters, 4.2, um, whereas the standard criteria is more like 5 centimeters. That's right, yeah, much larger. Um, so this is where the, the, the native aorta is, is replaced. Um, by a graft, and then the, the stent graft is placed in the distal portion. And you can see that the stent graft goes all the way across the arch. All the way, almost to the SDJ. In, into zone yep. zero. So it, it and what we it do stops is there, we, right. we mark where these branches come off with a, with a radiopaque marker, and then we land that right up to it. And one of the things that's helped us is <clears throat> our experience with transcatheter valves right. and placing wires that are stiff in the ventricle. Across aortic valve, across right? Across aortic valve. So we do that just like we do a transcatheter valve, and that, that orients the uh, stent graft directly down toward the valve, so we have less parallax area and less likely of leakage up in this area. So you're railing really to keep it stabilized and deployment is much better. And deployment is better, yeah. and, it, and it's pointed in the right direction right. so that it, you end up with it where, where you want it. Um, type 3 is more like a standard elephant trunk with debranching, and uh, again, it doesn't really matter if you uh, sew this as an island or as individual branches, you really end up with the same result. It just depends on what the tissue is like. Yeah, very complex, and this is stuff that we don't expect you to know or even manage, but it gives you an idea and a flavor of what are the capabilities of our Atlanta hospital when it comes to this level of care. Correct, because it, it does, I mean, the terminology is difficult and it, right. it, it, it's, it does get very complex, but there are a lot of this options. Is what, this is what we love though. This is what we love. It, and right. there are a lot of options for how to repair it and we just have to pick the best one that fits that patient. That's anatomy. exactly right, individualizing it like you said earlier. Um, so this is just a, a, a picture of one post-op. This is a, a type one debranching. Uh, this is native aorta here. Um, this is the debranch graft that goes to the anominate and to the uh, carotid, and then you can see the stent graft in the back, and there's no flow outside of the uh, stent graft. And so this aortic valve is native. This coronary arteries are native. So unlike what we showed you before where the root was replaced, the root is intact here. It's above the, uh, in the mid-ascending and, uh, and further distally where you've replaced it. Correct. But if you needed to replace the valve... You could. You could add that. Right. Yeah. Okay. Great. And then... The frozen elephant trunk that we talked about just <clears throat> a little bit, um, this has been very helpful for acute type A dissections. Um, this was refined by Dr. Roselli uh, at Cleveland Clinic and it published a paper in 2017. And a stent graft is placed during circulatory rest into the descending aorta that actually covers the subclavian. And then a hole is made in that in a branch placed in a separate smaller covered stent a Viabon stent is placed into the subclavian to maintain flow to the subclavian. And this actually seals in the stent graft material where that stent is placed through the hole so that there's no uh, type 2 end to leak. Um, and then the proximal end is sewn with a running suture, just, just like if it was a standard elephant trunk. And then you can see that the, the graft that you place to the ascending, and this is placed just above the native valve, you really replace a huge section 
of ascending aorta. But look how much arch is left. Yeah, very little. Very little. Yeah. And so there's very little to become aneurysmal over time. So this is going to be stable over time. And you hope this is curative. And we hope right? that we won't have to see them back. That's right. And then, and then you got to worry about this. But if, if the stent graft is here and all the flow is in the true lumen and the false lumen over here, thrombosis, thrombosis. then they may not have trouble for, right. for their life. And so that, that's really what we're trying to do is to give them a very long term. I think that's uh, important, right? I mean, I think that getting them back to that normal life pattern or that normal uh, life curve is what we're really uh, especially, seeking Especially, Especially activity because yep. activity is what, if they, if they have a patent false lumen, we're really going to limit their lifting. And um, pe people don't like that. Of it, course it, it not. It affects their ability to work. And if we can thrombose that false lumen, we can liberalize their lifting capability right. and then their lifestyle. And better. you and I, when we do a lot of dissections, they're not in the, the 80s and 90 years old. A lot of times they're in their 40s and 50s. Many, many times. Right. That's right. Um, this is a, just a, a picture that we did of a frozen elephant trunk, and it just illustrates very nicely the seal around that Viabon stent. You, know, you see that there's no flow right. there. All the flow is uh, through the Viabon into the subclavian and then all the flow to the aorta stays within the aorta. And this one, we got complete thrombosis of the false lumen, that's which huge. is which is what we were looking for. Yeah, that's great. So then who, who, how to decide who gets what? One of the things that, you know, transcatheter valves have taught us because we've, we, we started out operating on these very old, very frail patients that just weren't a candidate for aortic valve surgery is the idea of frailty. And frailty affects your outcome so much that we developed some indices of frailty that we used to evaluate the transcatheter valves, and we've carried that over to the aortic realm so that we kind of know how big of a physiologic insult the patient is able to, to withstand. And so we tailor our care both to their anatomy and to their frailty so, to, so that we feel like they get through the surgery. It's so important, Morris. I mean, I, and we're fortunate that we have so many senior surgeons here at Piedmont at both institutions, at the Athens and Atlanta, that I think this becomes a lot more important knowing which patient, we can almost operate on anybody. It's the idea of picking the right patient with a group of people that, to me, has made a big difference over the last 15 years of my career. Right. And, and I, I think that to, to get to a successful outcome, sometimes you have to pull back and not do the, the, the full, uh, complete repair. Maybe something a little less, but something that's not going to be dangerous for them over the long haul but that they're going to survive and they're going to get back to independent living. And I love the idea that there's so many of us here together on one campus and also the guys at Athens who talk to us all the time, that we can make that as a collaborative decision, not well, only amongst multidisciplinary, but amongst ourselves. Correct. And I think that's very important. Correct. And, yeah. and, and very many of these cases, as you know, yeah. um, our office, all the surgeons yeah. are in one office. And so we show each other things. Hey, what do you think about this? What do you think? You know, let me tell you about the patient. Well, you know, what do you think is a good Absolutely. idea and what's not a good idea? Yeah, that's perfect. So let, let's just go over a few case studies just sure. to, to yeah. il illustrate some of these points. Absolutely. Um, you know, we said we try to not stent graft in zone zero. I remember you said that. Um, but. <laughs> but this is one where we did stent graft in right. zone zero, and, and we didn't do a debranching. We, what we did was uh, we needed, uh, this was a patient who'd had a cardiac transplant. He had been re-explored twice for his native aortic fragility and bleeding within the first two days. And he developed a big pseudoaneurysm, but he had had a very difficult course. His frailty index was very high. We didn't feel like he could withstand another sternotomy, right. um, but we felt like he could withstand endovascular repair. But we had to land that stent graft in between the coronaries below and the innominate artery above. Yeah, just so that's perfect. Very, yeah, perfect. It had yeah. to be perfect. Right. And so landing it just above the coronaries, we involved one of our transcatheter, um, you know, structural uh, interventional cardiologists to both uh, show us the anatomy. They, they knew the gantry angles to get right. the best shots for the coronaries, pick which ones was the highest, and then get the angle where we knew that the stent graft was not going to impinge on that coronary. And so that, that was the one that we used for our landing of the, of the more proximal portion right up next to the coronary. So we, we landed one segment right up next to the coronary here, and then the pseudoaneurysm actually was fed by up here, so we had to land the distal end of it adjacent to the innominate artery, and that was when our vascular colleagues were able to elucidate that anatomy um, it, you know, with uh, fluoroscopy and, and angiography. And so then we landed this um, right up next to the innominate, and 
There it goes. There it goes. And it's sealed completely. Yeah, and perfect the, overlap. And perfect overlap. It's sealed uh, totally. The pseudoaneurysm uh, had no flow, and the patient went on to recover and went home and, and did fine. Yeah, that's great. What a great result on a transplant patient. Uh, makes very, you feel, uh, it, it gives you the warm fuzzy, right? Because the patient goes through so much just to get a transplant. And, and, and then we had done the transplant and they had this big complication wow. that we weren't sure was going to be survivable, but by uh, using the newer techniques, yeah, we, we got, them, got yeah. them through. So, um, This is another case. This is a, one of those young patients you were talking yeah, about. Absolutely. Um, that came in with an aortic dissection. Um, he's 37 years old. Um, he came in, he had a standard repair. Uh, he had some dissection in the arch. Um, this was before the days of the frozen elephant trunk. And so he didn't get a stent graft distally. I think that if he would have, he probably would have avoided this second stage. Um, but this was, this was years ago. And then over the years, um, his arch wow. continued to expand. So Morris, just use your pointer and show, show everybody what, what, so, what exactly are we looking at so, here. So this is his native root. Right. He had, very, he had mild aortic insufficiency. Right. Um, this is the graft that was placed at the time of his type A dissection repair. And that has become foreshortened to the point that it has gotten a big crease in it as this arch has grown and actually pushed it, pushed it pushed down, it down okay. toward the, the root. Um, this is the anomaly. It's hugely aneurysmal. The left carotid is dissected in its origin and then becomes more normal, a little more distally. And same for the subclavian. The subclavian is dissected in the proximal portion and then the distal portion, it becomes more normal. So we looked at this and we said, you know, really all of this has to go. Right. Um, a, a standard elephant trunk isn't going to address right. the um, dissected head vessels, which you can see here. Um, or the very dilated root. Um, so what, what we decided that we would do um, is do a debranching and place the, the grafts very high in the neck with uh, you know, one of the vascular surgeons and also all the way out to the subclavian artery, um, you know, out toward the arm because get to the part that wasn't dissected and, and then anastomose to it there so that okay. we would so we, we first did the debranch graft, and you see that the head vessels are well perfused. This is just a selective angiogram of that. So this shows the relationship of the debranch graft to the arch aneurysm. And as, as you can see right here, we have at least three centimeters of landing zone that should pr pr provide us with a good seal before it becomes really big and aneurysmal here in the, in the arch and the, in the uh, proximal descending. Um, so we landed the stent graft. And it didn't seal down in the landing zone, and so where that little stricture, not stricture, little, but where where it came together, where it, where it right. was, because it was narrow there, but didn't it was it was seated in there, but it didn't quite seal. So it popped a little distal. So we put a gusset of graft material around that and tightened up on it a little bit, and manipulating the order to get that uh, little piece of material around the stent graft pop back into the aneurysm. And so now it's completely expanded so that there's a big size discrepancy between the stent graft here and where it needs to land here that we didn't think we could do it. Yeah. And so now endovascular, are, endovascular techniques are no longer gonna work. Right. And so you need to be able to shift gears and go from an endovascular technique to an open technique. So we switched and went on cardiopulmonary bypass did circulatory rest and actually placed uh, a little segment of uh, hemoshield 28 graft, cut the stent graft off distally here, sewed the, the hemoshield graft to that, um, cut this with a little bit of a bevel and sewed it to the native uh, ascending aorta. And that res resulted in uh, flow only in the true lumen. That's amazing, yep. And then here's the, the CT scan afterwards. The ascending uh, has flow, the debranch graft has flow, There's the aneurysms and dissected segments are all bypassed. Um, this is the little segment of hemoshield graft, and then the stent graft starts distally and directing all the flow into the true lumen. Yeah. <coughs> true, uh, I think a show of multi-collaborative, multidisciplinary, and quite honestly, in a hybrid room, we're able to quickly do that. We have two new hybrid rooms here. I know we have a hybrid room in Athens. We're able to do that type of stuff, mainly here in Atlanta, but still on the fly. Correct. That needs to be. Correct. And, and being able to switch from 
purely endovascular, or uh, this was even a hybrid. This was, right. you know, some open and some closed. But we weren't planning on doing circulatory arrest, and we, in fact, weren't using the heart-lung machine. It was right. the debranching doesn't always require the heart-lung machine. So in the hybrid room, there's plenty of room there. You just bring the heart-lung machine right. in, you cool down and, and turn that off. And because we had that debranch graph there, we were able to produce both head vessels um, and a grade the entire time. And so it, you know, it took about 30 minutes to do it, but the patient woke completely up the next day because uh, the, we, we perfused it with arterial pressure flow the entire time. What a testament to vascular and cardiac working together. It, it, yeah. the, the whole team was required. Perfusion, is a, this is a complex perfusion setup. This is complex for anesthesia. It's complex for the surgeons, and the surgeons have to communicate with each other about what, uh, th I think this is going to work, this is not going to work and we have to get that done in I real time. I think that's important for people to understand that, you know, in this community we have this level of care. I think that's critically important. Yeah, great. So here's one, one more, um, and I'll end with this. Um, this is sort of shows the final exam. This is how you put it all together. Um, because this required a lot of planning and a lot of different techniques right from the beginning. This was a patient only 53, healthy, active guy. He had had an AVR root bentol in 2004, and he developed this huge pseudoaneurysm. And you can see the blood leaking out of the aorta um, coming from the uh, proximal suture line there. That, but more impressive is the 3D reconstruction of it. This is the AP view. You can see this huge pseudoaneurysm, and it has this tongue that comes out. And you can see how this is flat right there. That's the sternum. That's the back of the sternum. So if you look at it on the lateral side, the pseudoaneurysm actually comes out and touches the sternum. So you, there's no way you're going to be able to open the sternum without getting into this. No. And, and so you're not going to be able to repair that. So we, we planned this ahead of time. We uh, did femoral cannulation. We did deep hypothermia and was ready for circulatory rest. Opened the chest, got into the pseudoaneurysm, was able to close that, resume flow, and then go in and do a big operation, a redo root replacement, a redo bentol, ascending replacement all the way to the arch with circulatory rest and retrograde cerebral perfusion. Um, because of the bleeding, we packed this open. We used delayed sternal closure. Which that, is normal. That's right. normal, that helps yeah. with hemostasis. It really sets the patient back about 24 hours, but that's it. Yeah. Um, we closed him the next day, and on post-op day 10, he walked out of here and went home. Yeah, this is, uh, that's beautiful. What a beautiful result. So that, what are the key points of all this complicated stuff? It, it's, um, you have to know the disease, you have to know the terminology and the lingo, and mainly know the tools because there's a lot of different ways to fix this and everybody has a different slant on it. And that's why the multidisciplinary um, team and everybody having a different view on it is so important because you don't go into this knowing what you have to do. You have to discuss it beforehand. And many times, a lot of this is discussed, and then it has to be changed on the fly. That's right, exactly. And I think that's what you'll see, Morris, as we go through this series of discussions that we're going to have with our Piedmont Heart Institute. This is a very, I think that's perfect. Know the diseases, know the lingo, know the tools. And I think we're going to talk about how complex and how simple cases we do here at Piedmont. Right. And... You know, utilize your team members, get, get their advice, get their opinions, and study the anatomy. The biggest key to success is knowing exactly what you're in for. And like I said, that not only allows you to do the repair, but that allows you to avoid some of the pitfalls. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then the results that we've gotten. You know, we've shown a lot of these cases that we've done with very good success. But the stuff that we do day in and day out, um, you know, we did 87 bentols last year, and we had no mortality. Yeah, that's great. Um, some of the I, other, I know a lot of my friends all over the country, and I don't know a single one of them who have that outcome, right, to be honest with you. Right. So, and, you know, yeah, it's great. And, you know, aortic dissections, um, you know, that, that historically is a 20% mortality operation, and it's less than a 5%. Yeah, at our um, institution. At our yeah. institution. Yeah, that's great. So we're, yeah, we're very lucky to have a very consistent OR team and consistent surgeons, and so it's been very helpful for us to have that level of care. So great. Well, Morris, I want to thank you so much. I've learned a lot. I hope you have too. And so uh, feel free to call us at any time, uh, all the way from the simple uh, aortic disease, like Morris talked about, which is aortic aneurysms to bentals, and then we did more complex stuff with arches and arch repair and the descending. 
um, and the variety of, uh, of faceted way of doing this with vascular surgeons. So we're here to help you in all of those. We're happy to see these patients and also longitudinally follow these patients. So this is a lifelong disease and we're here to manage these patients lifelong. So Right, and, and if you don't know who to call, just call, call one us. of us. And if yeah. it's not us, if it's, if it's purely a vascular, uh, we'll, we'll get our teammates involved and um, we'll, get, we'll get the patient taken care of. Whatever they need, we'll, we'll get it done. Absolutely. Morris, well, thank you so much. This has been great. Thank you. All right, thank you.